anything that seems easy to achieve big goals is probably not the way like yeah. what happened with an r08 crisis in america was that people got sharked into signing on to loans that just screwed them yeah. and then they didn't get paid out the banks got paid out because government will always protect the तो यहाँ पे सीखने की बात हो रही है चाइना में जो इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस आ जाता है वहाँ की इकोनॉमी को लेके एक दिक्कत आई थी उससे बहुत सारी चीजें क्या क्या सीखी जा सकती है उसी पे आज की वीडियो है वट इंडिया नीड्स टू लर्न फ्रॉम द चाइना इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस चाइना एवर क्रेडेंट क्राइसिस तो किसी भी समस्या से सीखने की जरूरत है कोई क्राइसिस तो कहीं भी आ सकते हैं तो देखते हैं इसी चीज़ पे आज का मैक्स मैस रिएक्शन आपको मेरे सेशन देखने में मदद है वीडियो लाइक जो करना चैनल को सब्सक्राइब जो करना और जो वीडियो लिंक और एक्टर्स का लिंक आपको डिस्क्रिप्शन मिल जाएगा Right now, there are hundreds of unfinished apartment towers across China. Social media footage shows crowds protesting in front of the offices of the Chinese real estate developer Evergrande. Now the big risk comes from property, where developers are crumbling under mountains of debt. Analysts fear the crisis could spread throughout China's property sector and the entire economy. The Communist Party is paranoid. It is obsessed with internal security. So the question is, will the Chinese government step in and act as a backstop? Hi everybody. China is witnessing one of the most challenging economic crises in its history. The real estate market which accounts for nearly 30% of its GDP has come crashing down in the past 1 year. Property sales plummeted by 72% and thousands of people are now protesting in 86 cities. And now there is a banking crisis whereby banks have started freezing the accounts of the depositors. And in spite of all this trouble, experts say that this is just the beginning of one of the worst economic crises that is to follow in China. The question is why is China at the brink of an economic crisis what exactly went wrong with the real estate market of China and most importantly what are the lessons that India needs to learn from this Chinese economic crisis thousands during this time China was an ultra fast growing country this is when the manufacturing revolution of China was at its peak wherein companies from all across the world were setting up their manufacturing hubs in the cities of China before this time China was just another agricultural nation with very little to nothing to do with globalization so if you look at our urbanization in china after 1995 huge chunks of population started moving from the rural places to the cities of china so back then only 29% of the population was living in the cities but after 1995 you will see that the population in the cities skyrocketed to nearly 50% of the entire population and today 63.89% of the chinese population as in nearly 900 million people live in the cities now the catch over here is that in china unlike in india you cannot own a land so the entire land of china is owned by the state and can only be given on a lease to the builders and developers so when so many people started migrating to the cities the demand for houses skyrocketed and when demand for a product skyrockets what happens the price of the product increases and more and more players jump into the market to cater to the rising demand so not so surprisingly hundreds of developers flooded into the chinese market to meet this demand and this is where we saw the massive rise of chinese real estate developers now as we all know construction is an extremely capital intensive business so these companies first of all took heavy loans on the banks to pay the heavy leasing amount to the state then they took even heavier loans to build these buildings and started selling them to the people of china now from the chinese bank standpoint construction was an amazing business to lend to why because there was already over demand in the market the business had a healthy profit margin of 15 to 20% in spite of being a high ticket business and most importantly from the state's perspective it generates a lot of employment profits a huge supply chain of steel glass cement brick and hundreds of other suppliers and eventually makes a huge contribution to the gdp of china by giving jobs to many many workers in fact this is the reason why real estate contributed to almost 30% of the chinese gross domestic product this is the reason why banks kept on lending the developers kept on building and the people of china kept on buying houses and due to this increasing demand the price of houses increased so more lending more developers and more sales and this is why ladies and gentlemen the property boom in the chinese economy started as a result the real estate prices in china started shooting to new peaks making the chinese cities some of the most expensive cities in the world now just to give you an idea about how bad the condition is there is this index called price to income ratio to understand the affordability of houses in a particular locality it's nothing but the ratio of the price of an average apartment to the median household income of that particular place 
So if this index is 10 for New York, it means that it would take 10 years of the median household income to buy an apartment in New York. So while a median New York household needs 9.92 years of income to buy an apartment, in London it's 17.3 years, in Mumbai it's 26 years, whereas in Beijing it's 56 years. And even in other Chinese cities, it's more than 35 years. Now the question over here is, if the price of these houses was so so high, why were the Chinese still buying houses? Couldn't they just rent an apartment? Well, here's where, apart from urbanization, there are two more reasons why the Chinese were buying houses in spite of high prices. Number one, just like in India, even in China, you will be respected as a well-settled person only if you own a house. So if you're a man who does not own a house in China, the family will be too hesitant to get their daughter married to you. Secondly, just like gold is our go-to investment in India, for the Chinese people, property was the best investment instrument in the market. And just like our elders refrain from stock investing, even the Chinese people consider stocks to be dangerous and real estate to be extremely safe. And if you look at the increasing prices of the houses in China, it kind of looks like it was a great investment instrument. Cherry on the cake, there is zero property tax on buying private residential places in China. And you know what guys, in the race of this social norm, GDP and property boom, the Chinese developers built so many buildings that today there are buildings for 90 million people that are completely vacant. To put that into perspective, that is more than the entire population of France, Germany, Italy, UK and even Canada. And this led to the creation of what we know today as the ghost cities of China. Take a look. These are China's ghost cities, sprawling, empty spaces. city meant for thousands of people that's just completely empty. Many Chinese cities constantly conducting real estate development in pursuit of GDP growth simply turn urbanization into building houses and cities. But their floor areas and increase in population are out of sync, leading to the ghost city phenomenon. And guess what? Most of these apartments are already owned by the people in the hope that the real estate prices will go up and their investments will appreciate. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, the government of China realized that they are in a super bubble where developers are borrowing dangerous sums of money to keep feeding the real estate bubble of China. So they came up with something called the three red line policy, whereby they put forth three criteria that the large real estate developers in China are supposed to clear. And only if they clear these criteria, they can extend their debts with the bank. These three criteria are liability to asset ratio of less than 70%, net gearing ratio of less than 100% and cash to short term debt ratio of at least one. Now this is a little complex, but don't worry, you don't have to understand all this. All you need to know is that if all three criteria are passed, then the company can increase its debt up to 15%. And as you keep breaching a criteria, the percentage at which your debt can grow will be decreased to 10%, 5% and then to 0%. And as soon as this announcement was done, all the real estate developers started cutting down on their expenses and started optimizing their finances. But, 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 while many, many medium and small scale developers fulfilled this criteria, as it turns out, the second largest real estate developer in China crossed all three lines. And this company is named China Evergrande Group. Evergrande borrowed a lot of money, what we call offshore in international financial markets, and it's probably not going to pay it back. China Evergrande is the most indebted real estate developer in China. Evergrande is a ticking time bomb, and it's about to blow up in the face of foreign investors. In other words, if this company fails, it hits 171 domestic banks in China. Now the question is, what exactly is wrong with Evergrande and why has a single company triggered such a massive unrest all across the country? Well, the story of Evergrande is pretty straightforward and astounding at the same time. The founder of the company saw the real estate wave, started the company to serve the over demand of homes, took a ton of loans from the banks, built huge buildings and sold them and made a lot of money. But the problem was that they were growing and borrowing at such a rapid pace that it started to get more and more dangerous. And if you look at the numbers, within just 10 years, they went from a revenue of 45.8 billion yuan to 507 billion yuan. This is mind blowing, right? But you know what guys, behind the scenes, they used all this debt not to complete the existing projects, but kept on funding new projects before the existing ones got sold out. So you will see that in this graph, from 2010 onwards, after they started expanding, the gap between the properties under development, contracted sales and completed projects started increasing. And as you can see, by 2021, it had already touched a dangerous level, whereby the completed projects held for sales were barely one sixth of the properties under development. And as a result of this super fast growth fueled by a mountain of debt, Evergrande ended up crossing all three red lines in the policy. And now they can no longer extend their debt with the banks. And this is where, ladies and gentlemen, the chain reaction starts. 
Now the question is, it's just another company that would go out of business, right? Then how is it possible that a single company going down can affect the growth of the second largest economy in the world? Well, here's where you need to know about a category of companies that are said to be too big to fail. In this case, if you see, Evergrande is not the only player to get affected. They are yet to pay bills worth $100 billion to their suppliers. This includes steel suppliers, cement suppliers, paint suppliers, trucking companies, brick suppliers and thousands of other vendors. And now that these supplies won't be paid, it directly affects their suppliers and their balance sheet. Secondly, the banks that have given out loans to Evergrande, they cannot get their money back unless all these Evergrande projects are sold out. But as we saw, most of these projects are still under development and the news of Evergrande has already sent shockwaves across the market. So now no one is going to buy those incomplete apartments, right? And what's even worse is that since these incomplete projects cannot be completed without more loans, even the people who have paid for the apartments cannot get their house or will lose their money altogether. And you know what guys, these angry home buyers are now waiting on as many as 1.6 million apartments. And many of these people have also taken out loans and now all home buyers are threatening not to pay mortgage on their loan at all. And if they don't pay the banks, the banks will have to write down $220 billion of mortgage loans which will put them in a disaster. Fun fact, mortgage loans account for 20% of all loans in China. So you can imagine how bad the condition is. And you know what, Evergrande did not just borrow from banks, they also raised billions of dollars from the common people through bonds. And now even those people will lose money. And the most insane fact of all is that, as of October 2021 itself, two thirds of the top 30 Chinese property firms have breached at least one of the metrics in the three red line policy. Which means more defaulting, more companies going out of business, more defaulting customers and more loss for suppliers and ultimately the collapse of one of the biggest sectors of the Chinese economy. This is the reason why there is so much chaos in China. Now what remains to be seen is how will the Chinese tackle this crisis and how will it prevent itself from a catastrophe. And this brings me to the last part of the episode and that are lessons that India needs to learn from this Chinese economic. Moving on to the lessons, the first thing we need to learn from this Chinese crisis is that investment instruments driven by mindless social norms will often cost both the people and the economy heavily. In this case, the Chinese definition of a well-settled person got a ton of debt piled up for the Chinese people in spite of the sky-high prices. So you see, in spite of it not making any economic sense, because of the social construct, it has now put millions of people's lives at stake. In our case in India, the same thing happened with FDs because we outright considered FDs to be safe because of the social norm without understanding inflation. Similarly, the mindless purchase of gold is now hindering our economy. So take a step back and assess whether your instruments are backed by calculated strategy or just mindless social norms. Number 2. Piling up of debt of any company might showcase accelerated growth in the beginning, but with today's volatile, uncertain and chaotic market conditions, it comes at the risk of everything falling apart at once. In our case, just like Evergrande, the Adani group is taking up a huge amount of debt. And like I said in the previous episode, it sounds both risky and genius to me. And as much as we must vouch for Indian businessmen to prosper and become the pillars of our economy, we must also keep an eye on the implications in case they start defaulting. And just like China had a huge supply chain, banks and people that got affected, if a huge business group in India starts defaulting, even our economy will face troubles. So be careful with that. And thirdly, with China being a monopoly with solar components and cobalt, because the Chinese banks have curtailed the lending, the cost of these trades to India might actually keep increasing. So keep an eye on your solar and electric stocks. The process start China will be very responsible for the major crisis in China. If I talk about the property business, then in South Asia, especially in this property, it is a way to understand that the amount you invest in the future, the amount you get a return in the future. We can do it, because we can't do it. China is a country, its economy will be destroyed, its economy will be destroyed. वो इस कदार पे कभी आएगा मैं तो नहीं सोच सकती थी और कम और किसी का मुझे नहीं पता लेकिन मैं क्योंकि अपनी नजर में चाइना को बहुत ज्यादा पावरफुल समझती हूँ तो यहाँ पे बहुत कुछ सीखने था क्योंकि चाइना एक अच्छी खासी कंट्री है जहाँ पे काफी सारी डेवलपमेंट करे जा रहे हैं बहुत सारी कंपनीज वहाँ पे एग्जिस्ट करती है तो वहाँ पे इस तरह का इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस आ जाए तो थोड़ा सरप्राइज होता है लेकिन उससे भी बात उनके उभरते कैसे है वो एक सीखने की चीज़ है इंडिया को भी स्पेशली चाहे कोई सी भी कंट्री हो क्योंकि ये जो चीज़ होती है इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस ये कभी कंट्रीज देख को नहीं आती कहीं पर भी आ सकती है इरेस्पेक्टेड ऑफ उस कंट्री में किस तरह की गवर्नमेंट है भले वो डेमोक्रेसी गवर्नमेंट हो चाहे वो किस तरह की ये इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस है पोलिटिकल 
क्राइसिस नहीं पोलिटिकल क्राइसिस तो पाकिस्तान में आते हैं लेकिन इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस कहीं भी आ सकते हैं तो ये थी आज के बारे में मैं सब रिएक्शन आप मेरे सेशन देखने मजा चैनल सब्सक्राइब करें मिलते दूसरे रोड में बाय बाय टेक केयर थैंक्स फॉर